So we're, we're in the stretch, two sessions uh, left, but it's a real privilege um, for me to introduce Dr. Huey Lin, who oversees, really developed and oversees our congenital heart disease program. Obtained his medical degree from University of Virginia, uh, Health Systems, residency with the Harvard Medical School, and his uh, car cardiology, both from pediatric and an adult at Saint, in St. Louis, specifically with the pediatric portion at St. Louis Children's Hospital. So he is the, our guy and the guy in the med center to give us an update regarding uh, congenital heart disease. Huey, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Jerry. So it's a real honor to actually get a chance to actually talk to you guys today. And um, what was really great is Nir actually introduced the field by talking about Fontan circulation. Raise your hand if you actually know what a Fontan circulation is. Great, awesome, perfect. That's the perfect setup for us today. We're gonna actually talk a little bit about that. Um, near the end of my talk. Here are my disclosures. So I am a speaker for Abumed and I am on the DSMB for the Sapien 3 trial in uh, pulmonic position. This is the other major disclosure, which is this is what most heart failure providers do when they see me coming, and this is probably why. Most of you probably don't have a whole lot of experience with congenital heart disease, but I would venture to say that probably in the next five to seven years, all of you will. And the reason why is because we think these numbers are gonna reach 2.2 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States alone by 2020. So it behooves us all to know a little bit about what the problems are going to be in these patients and when to refer for evaluation for mechanical support, transplantation, advanced heart failure management. So these are our topics for today. So I'm gonna to just touch very briefly about what we know about transplant and um, mechanical support in these patients, which is not much, unfortunately. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this word repair that we use and why it's a little bit of a problem and what you should be looking for in two of the major repairs that we often see. I'm, talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Eisenmenger syndrome, which is still continuing to be a problem that we have on a regular basis. And then finally, we're gonna to touch upon that Fontan circulation and what this mystery of the single ventricle physiology is. So, this is something that I learned from Carol Warnes. Today's most important point is a no-duh, okay? These patients were born with a heart defect. They have no idea of what normal is. This is something that Carol Warnes taught to me. So, at multiple times today, whenever the word asymptomatic comes up, and whenever you see a patient with congenital heart disease who says they're asymptomatic, think about just Jack, okay? they may not know what asymptomatic means. And we'll talk a little bit about why that actually has real clinical implications in a little bit. So first, starting with uh, me mechanical support and transplant and what we know uh, or what we under think we understand so far. So it turns out that hospitalizations for congenital heart disease and heart failure are rising, nearly doubling at this point in time. And it turns out that you actually need to have some sort of objective evaluation, such as cardiopulmonary exercise testing and semi-quantitative evaluation, such as the CL heart failure questionnaire because of this problem where these patients may not know what symptoms are or what asymptomatic truly means. It actually turns out that when you're just looking at single VAD for patients from the Intermax, that actually adults with congenital heart disease may actually have similar mortality to non-congenital heart uh, patients. It does turn out that when patients are listed 1A with adults uh, with congenital heart disease that they have a higher mortality and higher delisting for decompensation. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case. And then finally, as we've all heard, post-transplant mortality is higher in adults with congenital heart disease, especially at 30 days. And we'll dig a little bit deeper as to what's driving that. But it turns out when you start to look out at 10 years, it actually may be that these patients have a lower mortality. So first of all, ventricular assist devices. So a lot of the mortality in adult congenital heart disease is actually driven by, vent by ventricular assistance. And that's not too surprising because those patients are very sick, especially when we start talking about single ventricle physiology. But when we're talking about just an LVAD or just an LVAD in adults with congenital heart disease, it turns out that they don't have a significant difference in survival. And so in blue is adults with congenital heart disease getting um, LVADs, and in red is non-adult congenital heart disease patients getting LVADs in the Intermax registry. However, when we actually start talking about listing these patients and when they get to 1A status, um, and this is kind of an upside down Kaplan-Meier curve, so worse is higher, okay? And in the solid curve, that's adults with congenital heart disease listed 1A, and in the dotted line, that's non-adults with congenital heart disease listed with 1A. And these are looking at patients who die or become delisted because of decompensation. It actually turns out that there's a lot more delisting or deaths in adults with congenital heart disease. And the question is, why is that the case? Well, when you start looking at the predictors, the multivariate predictors for this, it turns out it's renal function. 
being in an ICU or just being hospitalized in general, being on a ventilator, having an albumin of less than 3.2. And these are basically very sick patients then when we actually start looking at adults with congenital heart disease, which is contrary to what you might think because these are typically younger patients. They typically have fewer comorbidities. So the authors of this paper started asking the question, is it possible that by the time we get them to 1A, they're already too sick? Is it possible that we're not looking for the right signs and symptoms of heart failure in these adults with congenital heart disease who say they're asymptomatic for most of their lives? And then finally, is it possible that we're reluctant to transplant these patients and therefore they may be waiting too long? Well, why are we uh, waiting too long? Well, it turns out that this is the number that always makes people nervous. When you look at comparing, in this meta-analysis, adults with congenital heart disease versus non-congenital heart disease patients, they have almost a two-fold risk of 30-day mortality after transplant. And in this forest plot, you can see that when you bring all these studies together, it favors non-congenital heart patients. On the other hand, when you start looking at 10-year transplant mortality, actually adults with congenital heart disease do better. It's about 0.75 for their risk, and it favors congenital heart disease. So let's drill down a little bit further to understand what actually happens in those 30 days and who actually is at risk. Well, no surprise, it's really the single ventricle. So here, we're looking at single ventricle patients, and they have a three-fold increase in risk for 30-day mortality post-transplant when compared to their non-congenital counterparts. But then when you take them out of the adult congenital heart population and look at just adults with congenital heart disease with a biventricular palliation, it turns out that they're nearly at the line of identity compared to their non-adult congenital counterparts. So is it possible that at the end of the day, we're getting these single ventricles too late? And is this really just about patient selection, just like everything else is when it comes to mechanical support and transplant? So just to quickly summarize before we move on to the next topic, we really need to use objective and semi-quantitative ways to look at these patients because they may not understand what symptoms truly are. Ventricular assist device survival is not significantly different from non-congenital counterparts. There is a higher mortality in patients um, who are listed 1A with adult congenital heart disease. And it actually turns out that even though 30-day mortality is higher in adults with congenital heart disease, this is driven by the single ventricle population. And when you look at 10 years, it may actually be better than non-congenital patients. So let's talk about this thing called repair. So it's actually a myth, just like Santa Claus or Easter Bunny, because none of these patients are fully, truly repaired. And that's what I really want you to take away, in addition to this just jack thing that I've been talking about. So let's start with the common problem that we have, which is tetralogy flow, which comes back to us very frequently. So to remind you, tetralogy flow basically is two problems when these kids are born. They have an obstruction out the right ventricle outflow tract due to muscular obstruction and a VSD. In addition, their pulmonic outflow is very small. So what the surgeon has to do is to slice out the muscle bundles that are obstructing and then cut across the pulmonic valve annulus to augment it as large as possible because you can't just put a pulmonic valve in these patients because they're babies. The problem is when you slice across the pulmonic valve and patch it, all these patients are eventually going to need a valve replacement because they're left with wide open pulmonic insufficiency. You may have been taught pulmonic insufficiency, no big deal. Well, turns out that's not the case. So this is an asymptomatic patient of mine. He came to see me for the very first time, 36 years of age. He's able to bench press 600 pounds, and he comes telling me that he's asymptomatic, but he has these palpitations. So I put an event monitor on him, and this is what he gets. So he has a 38-beat run of VT. Why does he have that? Well, when we looked at his MRI, this is what his MRI looks like. So this is his right ventricle. This is his left ventricle. You can see this is a problem. Most of his chest now is right ventricle because of 30-something years of wide open pulmonic insufficiency. So PI is not benign. So all these patients who have had a repair of tetralogy flow, and the word that we really like to use is complete repair, have wide open pulmonic insufficiency and severe RV enlargement. So he gets a pulmonic valve replacement. He gets everything taken care of. He gets a bioprosthetic valve, and he's discharged early. But what happens next? Well. This is the next problem that we encounter. So this is a 30-year-old woman who was referred to us through the transplant program. So she had her initial complete repair in early childhood, and then she had her second surgery to replace that pulmonic valve, just like I told you that she's gonna need to have done. But you can see here, our patient got a 27 valve. This patient got a 21 valve. We're going to have a problem here. So now she has super systemic RV pressure, and she's actually got RV dysfunction. And it was thought that maybe she's gonna need a transplant, because how else are we gonna fix this problem? Well, why does she have a problem? 
Well, she has a Russian doll issue. So if you look at this valve, it's 21, but that really means that it's an internal diameter of 19, which means that if I then put a transcatheter valve in, it's gonna be 17. So mandatorily, this is gonna create patient process mismatch. So we have to find another solution for this. So what we're now doing these days is doing this. We're actually gonna break the valve ring. So we take a high pressure balloon, to, um, and then we have a palpal click, which means that we've broken the ring. Then we put a transcatheter valve in just like this. And so we can actually get the right size transcatheter valve in and hopefully buy her at least another 10 to 15 years before she actually has problems. And this is what it looks like at the end. You can hopefully see, appreciate that her RV function is normalized at this point in time. So in quick summary about tetralogy flow, they typically have RV enlargement um, due to severe PR and RV failure ultimately. They develop ventricular arrhythmias from this they can get prosthetic pulmonic stenosis after they get their initial pulmonic valve replacement. They can and also will develop LV dysfunction as well as aortic regurgitation and aortic root enlargement. So moving very quickly, and I'll probably have to skip a little bit about this. This is actually one of the patients that was actually referred to our transplant program. So he's a 29-year-old man with transposition of the great arteries. And this is not the Mayo format. So this is the right ventricle, which is the systemic ventricle. And this is uh, moderate to severe pulmon uh, sorry, tricuspid insufficiency. He was transferred for transplant evaluation um, on a milrinone drip. So how did we get here? Well, as you remember, transposition basically is things are reversed. The right ventricle gives rise to the aorta, which then goes through the systemic circulation and comes out blue through the SVC and IVC, which returns again to the right atrium. Whereas the LV is hooked up to the pulmonary artery at birth, um, goes through the pulmonary circulation and comes back red through the pulmonary veins back to the left atrium. So we don't have a crossing of these circulations and these patients are basically dying from the moment that they're born. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to create a shunt at the atrial level, but that's only a temporary solution. Ultimately, what ended up happening with this patient was he had an atrial switch. And the idea was that we would crisscross the circulations at the atrial level. So the SVC and IVC were directed to the left atrium, which gives rise to the left ventricle, and pumps that blue blood to the pulmonary artery, which then returns red to the pulmonary veins, and then is baffled to the right atrium, right ventricle, which then pumps that systemic uh, um, um, arterial blood to the systemic circulation. And now we have um, a situation that the patient can survive to adulthood with. But you can see where the problem lies, right? Now you have the right ventricle hooked up to the aorta, which is a systemic circulation, so you have chronic systemic RV pressure overload. Okay, so what happened to our patient? Well, now he also has moderate to severe tricuspid insufficiency, so now he's a setup for immediate failure, and that's why he went into cardiogenic shock, because he has both RV pressure overload as well as RV volume overload. And so what that means for us in these patients is the minute that you see these patients start to develop heart failure and tricuspid regurgitation, that is when they may go down the drain very quickly, and you need to start thinking about advanced heart failure therapies very timely. Um, as well, you have to take atrial arrhythmias very seriously because they could potentially degenerate into ventricular fibrillation, and these patients are at risk for sudden death. So just really quickly, the contemporary solution for um, uh, transposition of the great arteries is it's to actually solve the problem, which is to switch the arteries. And the problem, though, is that this is done in the neonatal period, and you have to bring the coronaries with you to the neo aorta. So when you do surgery on the coronaries in these neonates, you can imagine there may be a potential problem, which is that you can kink the coronary arteries. And so these patients may present all the way into adulthood with ischemic cardiomyopathy or even angina due to the coronary kinking. The other major problem is you have to bring the pulmonary artery forward, and so you can actually create pulmonary arterial stenoses, which may manifest itself as RV pressure overload or look like pulmonary hypertension when these patients present. And unfortunately, if a patient shows up in your emergency room of 20-something years of age, this is probably what they have had, and we're still learning how these patients are going to do in the future. So. Quick summary, systemic RV failure, look out for tricuspid regurgitation and atrial arrhythmias in the atrial switch patients. In the arterial switch patients, remember if they have a cardiomyopathy, it may be because their coronaries are kinked and look very carefully for pulmonary arterial stenoses. So quickly, Eisenmenger syndrome, I'm just gonna switch to the things that we have to watch out for, which is in Eisenmenger patients, you have to watch for the systemic vascular resistance, you have to maintain their euvolemia, watch out for embolic events because they have a mandatory potential for right to left shunting. And then finally, if I can leave you with one thing, that is watch out for phlebotomy. Routine phlebotomy is no longer indicated in these patients because it actually turns out it leaves them iron deficient and microcytic, which actually may lead them to higher cerebrovascular events. So we no longer do that on a regular basis unless they actually have symptomatic events. <laughs>
So I want to move quickly because I actually want to get to single ventricle. So when you see a single ventricle patient, this is how you should react, okay? <laughs> So the real problem with single ventricle is identifying. And so this is what single ventricle looks like in the Fontan circulation. So this is a 40 flow that was given to me by Kelly Jarvis from Northwestern. And what you're looking at is the SVC in, in blue and the IVC flow going into the pulmonary arteries. And that's how the Fontan circulation works. So the key thing here that I'm hopefully going to leave you with is how to identify it. So look for three surgical stages, typically a shunt and then a glen, so look for the word glen, and then look for the word fontan. So if any of those are present, that may be a single ventricle. Other diagnoses I've seen a high behind, L transposition, double inlet left ventricle, Epstein's anomaly with Starnes procedure, pulmonary atresia, and the worst one that I hate the most is hole in the heart. <laughs> and then finally, the keywords to look for in these patients are any of these, fontan, lateral tunnel fontan, extracardiac conduit fontan, total cable pulmonary connection, atrial pulmonary fontan. These are in your PDF if you guys were able to download that. So let's talk about actual single ventricle. So I'm gonna take an example of a quote unquote hypoplastic right heart, um, which is tricuspid atresia. So as you can see here, the RV is not present because there's no tricuspid valve. And there's this hypothesis called no flow, no grow. If you don't have a valve, you don't develop that ventricle. So mandatorily, these patients have to have some sort of atrial shunt. So this uh, blue blood comes in through the SVC in the right atrium and then shunts over to the left atrium. Then in the left ventricle, you have this mixed blood that gets pumped into the aorta to the systemic circulation. And they typically have a sat around 80s, possibly even the 70s. These babies are alive at birth because they have a patent ductus arteriosus, which allows flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, as you can see here. But what happens on day five to seven of these babies after they're born? PDA closes, right, most of the time. So you have to do something or else that pulmonary circulation is gonna go down and that patient will actually arrest. So what we learned very early on is these patients all need a surgical shunt of some kind and these have many different names. Bilalactosic is probably the most common that we still use today. Sometimes you will hear about in the older patients, a Waterston Cooley, a central shunt is still being used today, a POTS shunt in older patients. In hypoplastic left heart patients, you'll see, often see a Sano shunt as well. So look for those words to key you into this being a single ventricle patient because they may not know it. Again, you can imagine, they may think they're asymptomatic. Of course they're not asymptomatic. They only have one ventricle. How could they possibly be asymptomatic? So be very suspicious when they tell you they have no symptoms. So the next two stages are called the Glen shunt and then the Fontan. So the Glen is then where you take the SVC and connect it directly to the pulmonary arteries, completely bypassing any type of right-sided ventricle. This is how you get away without having a right ventricle. The IVC still continues to the common atrium and then gives rise to blood flow to the systemic ventricle and then the systemic circulation. The Fontan allows you to no longer have cyanosis because now you have the IVC connected to the pulmonary arterial structures as well. So now you have SVC and IVC, also called the total cable pulmonary connection to the pulmonary arteries. Now, this has a whole host of problems as you can imagine, right? Because we were meant to have a right ventricle. So what happens with these patients? Well, typically, obviously heart failure, right? Because if you're living off of one single ventricle, eventually you're gonna have a problem, especially if that happens to be a morphologic right ventricle. One of the really strange things that we see is this thing called protein losing enteropathy. And if you're not looking for it, it you will miss it. These patients will have very loose stools. They have an albumin of two, and that's when we know that they're very sick, and they may be beyond the ability of getting transplanted and may be driving that transplant mortality. Typically, these patients will develop liver failure, cirrhosis, and even potentially hepatocellular carcinoma. So all of them have to regularly have liver evaluations. And then, because they grew up being cyanotic, a lot of them will actually develop um, aortopulmonary collaterals, and hemoptysis may be their presentation. So in summary, what we've talked about today is a lot of different topics. But what I want to leave you with is that it actually turns out in selected patients, VAD and transplant may actually have similar mortality, non-adult congenital heart patients who are undergoing the same. But I think a lot of it is like everything else, patient selection and timing, which we still need to look into further. Repairs are a word that should be always kept in quotes, because at the end of the day, Almost all the repairs that we have in congenital heart disease have some sort of potential complication, and that's really what we need to do to look at these patients and evaluate them carefully. Isomanger patients, it's very much about maintaining good preload and a good afterload and avoiding routine phlebotomy. And then finally, 
one of the most important things in single ventricle is to identify them because they may not know that they're a single ventricle and may have some other diagnosis that they're carrying. Lastly, just Jack. Beware of asymptomatic. They're going to tell you they're asymptomatic, but again, they may not know what that means. So thank you for your time.